talking about. Pastor Gabriel encouraged everybody to make sure you're taking notes because there's a tendency to remember them if you write it down. A great place to take that note if you didn't know it. If you go to the back of your bulletin, you can write some things on that because there's some lines there uh, able to do that. We see that God has established a rhythm in the church and in our own personal bodies. In order to live, we have to take in air and breathe out air. There has to be a rhythm of the heart. That the heart beats erratically, you can have serious problems. If your breathing isn't done rhythm, in rhythm the way it should be, you can have serious problems. So rhythm has to do with everything that God said it would. We've been speaking on the rhythm, and, and specifically what we've been talking about, the rhythm of the individual Christian. Week number one, Pastor Stephanie talked about the rhythm needed to pray. Praying, talking to God. But one of the comments that she made that I think is very important is she, she made this comment, said, when we're praying, you have to understand we have to own it. Prayer has to be a personal thing. It can't be left up to intercessors, prayer warriors, pastors, teachers, mothers and fathers. It must be something that now we take on. As a matter of fact, by our lack of prayer, and concern about certain problems, the enemy's been able to come in without even a fight. So now it's time to take up every individual, every age person, this battle of intercession and praying for ourselves and for the kingdom of God. The second week I talked about fasting. How that's just some things can't be taken care of by just praying alone. Jesus said this kind, this type of problem is solved by fasting and prayer. When you fast, you get a more sensitive, spiritually heightened awareness. When you fast, along with praying, we are more aware of the spirit world and our faith is renewed and strengthened. Sometimes things bog us down and sometimes things don't cause us to clearly see or clearly hear the word of God. So I said that fasting is a lot like Drano. You start fasting and you pour it in and pretty soon you're draining and clogged and you can do a lot better. Amen. So sometimes just simply running water down that line doesn't get rid of everything. Sometimes things get plugged up. And they usually involve things concerning us. So rather than eating, we feast on the Word of God. Last week, Pastor Gabriel spoke on the rhythm of community evangelism. And every week these things are building towards something. You start by talking to God, then you energize and by fasting. And then through that, you have a awareness, you have a, a more of a spiritual sensitivity, and you actually are reaching out to love people the way God loved people. You see, because community is evangelism. Community is more than just eating together. It's loving each other so deeply that you want to live life together. You want to perform this Christian life in this world together. It's more than just coming. You won't be satisfied with just coming to church. You want more. You want, you want to reach out and touch people. You want people to reach out and touch you. You want to go and do something and show the world something they can't see from any other place except by a body that loves Jesus, that have died into themselves, but are now come alive in Christ and now have a specific goal to live and love like Jesus did. Community. And when the unbeliever witnesses that, they will want what you have. And when that happens, that's called evangelism. When somebody that doesn't know Christ sees what you've got and wants what you have, you're evangelizing. Because evangelizing is receiving Jesus Christ you did not have in your life, into your life. But one specific area uh, really spoke to me, and it's Ecclesiastes three verses one through eight, because it's a rhythm involved. Again, the theme of rhythm. The world has a rhythm. The earth has a rhythm. It says Ecclesiastes three, for everything there is a season or pattern or rhythm. The rhythm of seasons is what? Spring, summer, fall, winter. There's the rhythm there. Very, I don't remember a time where that's changed too much. Some of them may be shorter than we want them to be the seasons, but, but that's the way they occur here in Missouri anyway. And there's a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest. So as you look at that, there's, there's all these times, all these seasons, all these specific things that are given, give and take, give and take. You are born, then you die. You don't die, and then you're born. You are born, then you die in the natural you don't harvest and then you sow and then in the natural you 
you sow and then you harvest. So there has to be a pattern involved there. How many see what I'm saying? So there's a pattern or rhythm that this word says that's involved with harvest. And that's what I'm talking about this morning. I want to go a step beyond what you've ever understood before. Is I want to go beyond just teaching you what the Bible says about giving to teaching you why we need to give. I believe that's huge. I believe people can quote verses about giving, but they don't know why we need to give. They just know the verses. Knowing something is 10% of a problem. Knowing why we need to do something is the other 90% of the problem. I can quote you verses all day long on certain things, but if I really haven't connected it in my heart and spirit, why? And I won't do it. Does that make sense? Giving, or the blessings of God, if you want to write this down, they come from God's rhythm that he's already established concerning giving. Giving has been a mystery to a lot of Christians. It makes no sense to a lot of Christians. I have to admit, when I first got saved, it did not make any sense to me. And the reason why I know that giving makes no sense is because only 15 to 25 percent of those that go to church actually tithe. Listen to what I'm saying. Are actually consistent in tithing. A higher percentage of that gives an offering, but only 15 to 25 percent give. So that basically says that 75% of the body of Christ is missing out on the rhythm that God has established for you to be blessed. 75% of the church are praying prayers that it would be very difficult for the Lord to answer because it says you sow and then you reap. It says you're born and then you die. There is a rhythm and we can't violate that rhythm. We can't say, no, 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 I don't want to sow, but I want to reap. Well, go out to your garden, what would be your garden next spring, speak to your garden, say, I'm going to be back in 90 days, and I expect to see some vegetables. And don't plant a seed and see what happens. You will reap what? Weeds. Weeds. Junk, but no vegetables. And if you do have any type of vegetables, it will only be because some tomato fell off last year, went into the ground, and an itty-bitty seed happened to get in the ground just right, and it come up as a volunteer. But it still came up because there was a seed involved. How many see what I'm saying? All of your receiving, all of your blessing is revolving around the seed. The tithe... The tithe is the 10% that the Word of God teaches that we give back into the local body, the church, the place where God has called you to serve and where you receive the Word of God. That is where it goes. One of the reasons people are not blessed like they should is because they designate their tithe in places other than what God tells them to. I met people that took their tithe, 10%, and they gave it to a local this or somebody on television or radio or whatever or gave it to somebody that was in need of some money. The Bible doesn't say that. Those are offerings that those are supposed to be. The tithe belongs to the local church, and I have no say-so in that because the Bible says that's where it goes. So if you're one of those that think that when you, you receive some type of blessing from God that it's up to you and you have to make these decisions, you're wrong. The Bible's already made this decision. It's 10%. Wherever God has blessed you, that area of blessing is a candidate to be tithed. Wherever you've been blessed, wherever you've received increase from something, whatever that was is a candidate for tithing. Some people say, I don't know what to tithe. Is it just my paycheck? No, no, it's whatever your increase is. What do you mean? Well, I'm saying that, that besides the salary, the Bible clearly says it's the increase it's not certain fruits and other fruits you don't have to t- give on. I mean, we have people here, and I, I love it, when, when it comes time and, and their tomato pans start producing or a cucumber, they come and bring the first tomato, first cucumber from their garden and bring it to the Lord and lay it on the altar. You say, why? It's the first part. How I many know what I'm talking about? 
It's the first part belongs to God. The tithe is not something I give to God because of any other reason, the fact that it already belongs to God. Your tithe can never be a seed. The seed is what you give out of the 90% left over that you have. What else? Settlements, inheritances, profits from sales, gifts, financial. These are all things where you have increased. These are all things that, that because of that increase, they must be considered as candidates for tithing. If you're a Christian business, you tithe off the profits. If you, if you have sold something for a profit, whatever it is, stocks, bonds, properties, whatever, whatever your profit is, you tithe off of it. If, be, if you've been increased even on, a, and on an income tax refund, you tithe off of it. It's an increase. See, these are areas nobody wants to talk to you about, but I'm telling you, if I don't tell you these things, you're going to get robbed. You must clearly understand the avenues and pathways that God's determined for us to give. And one of them is called the tithe. The second type of giving is called the free will offering. How many think they know what that is? Raise your hand. Come on. I'm going to give it to you straight. The free will offering is everything you give besides a tithe. That's it. You freely give of whatever God tells you, of that that is left over, you pray about it, and God tells you what to do to support like missions or guest speakers or organizations that are worthwhile, people that are needing and hurting and all these things. These are free will offerings. It's not the tithe that goes to these things. It's the fact that this comes out of your increase, your increase. This is a part of the harvest that came from the seed that you planted. So from your salary like mine, that, that I give the tithe, but I also support different things in the church, your ash and mission, stuff like you do, and even outside the church I support causes. And, but I give out of that other 90%, which also includes my groceries and this and that, like you, and utilities. So I prayerfully ask God to help me what to do? Prayerfully ask God to help me what to do. And God is very faithful with that. Let me see what I'm saying. So, the seed, when you put it in the ground, brings forth a harvest. Say a good amen. But the tithe is the water that you put on the seed. A seed left into itself without nourishment and moisture, once it's planted, it won't produce. It must receive moisture. It must receive water. Water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. How many see what I'm saying? Water comes from heaven. Water comes from God. Come on, shake your head, everybody. And the water, the tithe that we give, waters our seed. A lot of people like to just plant seed but never water it. So what happens is you may get some harvest, but it's only because an occasional mercy cloud comes by. Well, you may be standing next to somebody that is totally blessed and practicing tithing and offering, and they're getting rain, but because your yard attaches to theirs, you're getting rain too. Hallelujah. And God is merciful to us. So He can send the rain. But we have to understand that even when He sends the rain and even when He sends the blessing, it's just because He loves us. Because all giving is based on God's love. Let me see this. Uh, Brian, help me about for a second, will you? I don't want to mess this up because this table has got some very explosive stuff on it. Did you just push this over? I don't want people online going, what are they doing over there? Okay, all right. Thank you. 
Ja. Any farmers here? Has anybody ever seen one of these? Let me see your hand. Some of the newer people have never seen this. This is called an ear of corn. So I thought corn was raised in cans. No. No. no, no. Inside of this ear of corn, sorry guys, the guys help clean up. Inside of this, which protects this, is the ear of corn. An average ear of corn has somewhere around 450 kernels in it. Did you know that? So, if I had two ears of corn, it would be like 900 kernels, right? And if I had 900 kernels, and each, if I had two ears, and each ear had 450, that would make 900 kernels for two ears. If I took and just planted two kernels of corn, and they were all seed corn, I would have a little under a half a million kernels at harvest from two ears. Are you seeing this? If I had two ears of corn, and I didn't eat it, and I didn't consume it, and I didn't just do something stupid with it, but I took just two ears of corn and 450 kernels per every ear, just two ears, and I planted it, I would then have an equivalent of a half a million kernels of corn at harvest. The dynamics are very simple. It doesn't make sense that I can take one kernel and get 450 out of it. It doesn't make sense that something so small as a kernel of corn can do something so alive and so, and so fantastic as that. But it's true. The problem is so many times that we don't think we should give because it doesn't, it's insignificant. It doesn't matter too much. So what we do is rather than give a kernel or give whatever God tells us, we eat our corn. We take it and say, it's not enough to make a difference. I'll just use it on myself. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have the needs of life and the necessities of life. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about stuff that you know what I'm talking about. Stuff that we go in debt for that does us no good. That's going to waste up, dry up, blow up, be too small in six months. Can't be out of fashion or can't even do something with it in six years. God wants you and I to understand that there takes a corn kernel to be planted for an ear of corn to be received. There's profit in all of this, God says, and we are profited by it. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all of your needs according to your riches in, in Christ. Glory in Christ Jesus. What's that mean? God says that I will, because of my love for you, and because giving is based on love as far as God's concerned. See, for us, giving may not be based on love in here. Sometimes we may hear, hear a good story, and we may be emotionally driven, and we may be given out of emotion. We'll give towards that, and somebody asks us later about what we do, and we don't even remember. But God loves us so much, He sees our needs, and He says, I have provided a way to take care of your needs. I've given you a rhythm of blessing, a rhythm of provision to take care of your needs. Tithe, sow, receive the harvest. Tithe, sow, receive the harvest. If you don't do any one of those, if you only do one of those, you mess up the rhythm. And by messing up the rhythm, what happens is you mess up your ability to receive what God has for you to have an abundant life. The Bible says in Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you what? Press down, good. What else? Running over, what else? All right. Give and it shall be given unto you. See, what this tells me is that 
God never gives back to me in the same way that I gave to him. God never gives it back to me the same way I give it to him. Now, in the measure that I give it, how I give it, he'll give it back to me in the same measure. But God never gives back to me the same way. What this Bible verse says is, watch this. When I give, it shall be given back to me, pressed down. You know what this is? Concentrated orange juice. What is concentrated orange juice? It's pressed down orange juice. That I can take a little bottle like this, drop it into a big, and make a pitcher out of that small thing. Why? Because it may look small, but it's pressed down, it's condensed, it's high powered. What God gives you back will be concentrated, will be pressed down. It will be much more effective and much more anointed than what you give him. Say a good amen. Amen. Then it says, not just that, it shall be pressed down. When I give to God, it shall be pressed down when I receive it. But it also says, what? It will be shaken together. I can reach you from here. (laughs) It will be shaken together and running over. Isn't that what happens? When you shake this together and it runs over. So when I gave him something like this, he says, but you're not going to get it back like that. You're going to get it anointed. You're going to get it empowered, pressed down, shaken together and running over. You can expect that because God's word says that. See, a lot of the things that we are not receiving today from God, it's not because of God, it's because we are not expecting God's Word to work for us. And if we're God's words were not working for us, we all need to just quit. Because my salvation is based on God's Word. My life in eternity is based on God's Word. And if I can't believe this Word that you see up there, then why can't I believe anything else? It's funny how we can believe God with our soul and our eternity, but we can't believe him for a dollar. Come on, somebody. If you listen to what I'm saying, you're going to go beyond just knowing these verses to knowing why. Because it's God's economy. It's God's rhythm to do it this way. Can I say something to you that I don't even have this in my note, but I know it to be true. When, when God created the garden first, and then he set man over it to be the watcher or the keeper of it, the manager of it. Man was responsible to manage the garden, everything. In other words, God did not give man something. It, the garden was made by God. But man didn't receive the garden with just sit back in your chair and play guitar and just have a good time. He was given the responsibility to manage it. Isn't that what the Bible says? Manage it. Go forth and prune it. Okay. Our giving, how we give, shows God if, we can, if we're responsible managers. A principle was started in Genesis chapter 2. If we are not responsible at managing something, God is not going to bless us with it. Because God doesn't want to waste his blessing. God looks at us and sees if we're walking in responsibility to his word. And because of that, then, listen, and then the blessing comes. God's looking at my life and he's trying to say, Tony Hensler, are you sowing good seed or bad seed? What what do you mean good seed or bad seed? Well, I have, when I know the word, I understand that the good seed produces a good harvest and the bad seed produces a bad harvest. Bad seed is when you're sowing something that, that is going to bring something bad, worse to you. For instance, how many have a credit card? I have, a, I have two of them, right? They're not bad in and of themselves, but if I live off of the credit in the credit card because I don't have the money to pay what, for what I need or even pay the credit card bill, it's going to take you 400 years to pay it back at $2 a month. 
So what I've done is when I use the credit card or I take out a loan on something, what I've done is I'm planting a bad seed. Listen to me. I'm planting a bad seed that I am going to reap in the months that follow. Well, no, everybody has to do it. No, they don't. If you pray and if you get a hold of God, God will show you the path that you need to walk and just exactly what you need to do. My God shall supply all your wants. No, needs. And so we get in trouble because we planted a seed of debt, planted a seed by the way we've done things that are not good according to God's word, and we start to reap it in due time, and we're screaming and crying, where's God? And God says, you're just reaping your harvest. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? And I learned this, that that God wants to bless me. He blesses me out of his love. But it's okay not to have something. We have needs and necessities. You need those, right? House, food, water, clothes, right? But to have the most expensive of that may not be needed. Or to have the largest of that to keep up with somebody else may not be needed. So we've taken something that we really need, but we've made it more of a want. Well, this would suffice, but I want that. How many have ever heard when you tell the little kids your eyes are bigger than your stomach? Well, that happens to adults. And because sometimes when our eyes get bigger than our stomach, when it comes to buying and spending or whatever, we, we sow bad seeds. The debt on it kills us. Please understand, I'm, I, we, this is a struggle all Christians have to, have to make up their mind on. Everybody has to make up their mind. You need to have a plan. I, I'm remembered of the I'm remembered of the story that, that, that Rick and Adrian told us several years ago. We were talking about giving, and they were talking about how they took the, uh, the Financial Peace University that Micah was giving, and, and they went through the class. And, and the goal of this thing was to eradicate debt over so many weeks and establish a different lifestyle where you're no longer planting bad seeds, you prioritize. And in time, you get yourself out of debt and you start with a new pattern. If, if God bails you out and gets you out of debt and then you turn around and you go right back into debt, that means you're going around the same mountain you've been going through before and you're going to ask God to bail you out again. Which means you're not managing. If you're not managing, He can't trust you with it. I am convinced that God would give us much more if he can trust us with it. What do you mean? If God can trust me to give that dollar, or 10 or 15 or 20, when I really don't have a lot, or 50 or 100, or when I really don't have a lot, I know, then he knows he can trust me with that 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. I don't know if you know this story, but, I, but and I'm going to keep names out of it, but, but it's true. Through the years, I'm like you, all we did was, you know, we, you know, we, we worked on old cars and got them, kept them going. How many know what I'm talking about? Because you just can't go out every year and buy a new car. Now, I know that's strange for some to pre- teach prosperity. I said, it's a lack of faith or I should have a new car. I got something in the Greek. It's, it's, it's good, prudent responsibility. If God says do it, I'm going to do it, but God hasn't told me. So, so we've been doing it for a while, and one day I'm praying, and, and, and we had just done something here at the church, and, and, and uh, I'd sowed something, and, and the Lord said to me, I'm going to give you a new vehicle. So I kept it to myself so that people wouldn't go, he's losing it, he's nuts. He's become one of them on television. No, I didn't tell him. I told my wife and just kept it myself. And it wasn't too long after that, a person came up to me in this church and said, you know, this week the Lord spoke to me and he says, I'm supposed to buy you a new vehicle. Outside I'm going, but inside I'm going, yes. God's 
said so. So I, 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 how many of you know sometimes when things happen, you go, this is too good to believe. I think I'm sleeping. I think I'm, I'm in a daydream here. I'm just going to leave it alone. Anybody been in that? It's just too good. Well, you need to get there sometime because it's really cool. And, and so I'm sitting there and I, and I don't mess with it for a couple of weeks. And this person comes up to me and says, how come you haven't talked to me about the vehicle? I said, well, I don't really, you know, he said, listen, if you don't go out and get it, I'm going to go out and get one for you and give it to you. But I'm giving you a chance to go pick one out. Any kind you want. And we've been driving an old van at this time. And it was on its last legs. But, but uh, when we first came to the Church on the Rock and started, it, we had an old gray two-tone van. It was a Dodge 8 passenger, full-size van. It was 8 passenger. And we bought it personally bought it and used it for the church all those months in the beginning of the year, which was tough because we were using it for packing everything and taking things. And then we went to school and packed and unpacked along with the school bus and we were loading it down all the time. It took a pretty big beating. But that's all right because we, we did it and God gave it to us and it was His van. It's amazing. See, if it's, if it's really His, then you'll use it for God. If God says, God gave me this, then use it for God. How many think God gave you the car you have? Let me see your hand. Use it for God. Well, how do you do that? I'll get with you. Get with me. I'll let you know. How many think God give you the house you got? Use it for God. Oh. See what I'm saying? Or talent or whatever you got. So I, I went and I, 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 I chose one. I talked to the salesman. I said, okay, such and such is going to come in and take care of everything. I get a call a few hours later. Come pick up your van. It's been paid for. I didn't beg. I didn't ask. I had done nothing except just been faithful with the little things and took care of the things in the right rhythm. And I didn't know this rhythm thing was even real back then. I just figured God said it, I'll do it. But the difference is the doing it, not just Him saying it, it's the doing of it. Let me see what I'm saying. This is so, so, so important because... because God wants us to be a blessing for other people and to finance the kingdom of God first. The Bible says in Luke 6.38, with the measure that you, that, you, that you deal out, it will be the measure that comes back to you. Okay. See this? This is smaller than a, t- than a teaspoon. I got this at some place. I don't know. It's like a little sugar thing, right? And I looked at it, and God said, pick it up and take it with you. So I picked it up, took it with me, and I went, hmm, I hope you're not going to ask me to eat off this. <laughs> this be a cruel joke, God. And he says, just take it and keep it. So I put it in my cup holder in my car, and I've had it until this morning. And then the Scripture came. So I ran out to my car. In the measure in which I give, it's given back to me. So if I have this half teaspoon measure and I give a half a teaspoon to God, and God doesn't give back to me the same way. He gives back to me in the teaspoon, same, same utensil, the measure what I met with, but He gives back to me, pressed down, shaken together, running over. He may give back to me five of these two spoons by giving them one. Does it, does it make sense to you? So I get, or if I give a cup and sow into the kingdom of God, remember this is the tithe, this, this is the seed, the tithe waters it. He's going to give back to me, not the same type of cup, same type, but not the same way. He's going to give back to me, pressed down, shaking together, running over cup. And it could be five or ten of these. Because remember the concentrate really becomes a lot more. It goes farther. It spins better. I mean, I'm talking about. Okay. And so, if I give God a barrel of faithfulness and, and giving, He says, I'm not just going to give you a barrel back, Tony. I'm going to give you back, press down, shaking together, run over a barrel. Here's the problem. 
Now watch this. This is the problem, and I saw this years ago. I and you have had times when we've given God the, t- the teaspoon, and we got blessed. But when it come time to give again, we didn't take the whole blessing that we were given before. Remember the five or ten or whatever it was from the one? We just say, okay, I'm going to bless God again. One more spoon, God. And God said, whoa, 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 whoa. I gave you enough to fill up a cup. You gave this, and I blessed you with this amount. But now it's time to plant seed, and you want to give one of these again. Why not give one of these? Because if I understand the measure which I give out, I return. If I give out in dollars, I'll get back in dollars. If I give out in multiples of dollars, if I give out in fives, I'll get back in multiples of fives. If I give out in tens, I'll get back in... If I give out in fifties, I'll get back in multiples of fifties. I believe that because that's what the Bible says. But, we, but we're satisfied doing the safe thing, giving the half tablespoon. Okay, you get a half tablespoon. I got the cup, though. I'll take a half tablespoon from that cup. I'll take a half tablespoon from that cup. And he'll keep blessing you on the half tablespoon. When he said that the reason why you lack is because you haven't understand the rhythm of giving. This was given so you can have this. This was given so you can have this. There's no end to what God would do for us because he understands from our heart by being faithful that we're interested in, in working and helping in the kingdom of God, his purposes and his plans. We don't do this so that I can finally get there so I can buy a million dollar house or a jet plane. That's not what this is about. This is about the capacity to practice my management over what God gives me so that I am a candidate to manage even more so that I can help finance the kingdom of God. Does everybody see what I'm talking about? Oh, it's quiet in here. Let me tell you a story. I need a couple guys. Pick somebody out that looks like an angel. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let you pass, but pick somebody else. Who in here has a checkbook? Let me see. Somebody here have a checkbook? You have a checkbook? You have a checkbook, Debbie? Bring her over here. Yeah, bring your checkbook. Get an angel ready. Where's your angel at? Who? All right. Come set up here. I've got a... Whoop, whoop, help her, help her. That must be a heavy checkbook. Now I'll let you sit. That's the easy part. The measure in which you give shall be given back to you in the same measure. We already know, I've established the fact that this represents like a bucket of the blessings of God, I mean, a barrel of the blessings of God, right? Come on, shake your head. And these guys right now, regardless of how they really are, they're going to be angels right now. So they're all over here holding on this barrel of blessings, okay? This is Joe Christian. So Joe Christian's sitting in a chair, and the offering is about ready to be taken up. And Joe Christian, do this, is warning what they should give. You're very good at this. (laughs) Meantime, the Lord's sitting on his throne, looking down from heaven at earth, and waiting to see what his child is going to do. Do you understand God's watching everything? I thought he was asleep. No, he sees everything. So she pulls out her checkbook. And the Lord speaks to her and tells her what to write the check for. Are you following me? God knows what he's told her. Because he told her a thousand dollars. 
Immediately she thinks that comes from the devil. But God says, hey, boys, bring that bucket of blessing over here. Put it right next to the window of heaven. Because we think we're going to be pouring some of that out on somebody. Malachi 3. What window of heaven? Well, that's Malachi 3. He pour out a blessing by an open window of heaven. Right? And right there in her hand, she has the ability to get the open window or get the closed window. Or even determine the measure in which will be met out back to her. Because the Bible says that. Amen? Okay, so it says, hold it right there. I'm going to watch and see what she does. So God's watching her. And she's fighting within herself. thousand dollars. Or it could be $50. It, it just... It, it, the amount is insignificant. It's just more than you're used to or more than you even thought about. Get that much in your head. And she's battling. Battle with yourself. I love it. So, he, so he's watching his daughter to see how she's going to respond. In the meantime, she's saying, man, I wonder if that came from God. I mean, I asked him what to do, and that came to my head, but I, I, that doesn't make sense. That can't be God. God knows if I give that, it's going to cause me to run short. God knows if I do that, it, it's going to put some things in jeopardy. God knows that. Cannot be God. So then the enemy does finally speak to her and says, hey, you need to give a much smaller amount. You're still going to be giving. It's going to be good. You're still going to be giving. So she's battling, and, and they're all receptacles going by. And just before it gets to her, she writes it out for the smaller amount. And she drops it in there. Now, listen. All giving to the Lord is appreciated, but disobedient giving has its effects. It's not a bad seed, but it's a limited seed. Because all seeds produce, but it limits you if it's not the seed that God told you to. Because what did he have waiting for? Okay, so watch this. So the Lord sees this woman drop that much, much smaller check into the giving, and he tells his angels, why don't you take the barrel back? Here, give it to her. <laughs> God intended for her to have this, but she got this. The problem is some of us are happy with this. When God's not happy with this, he wants more for you because he sees what's coming down the road for your family. He sees what's coming down the road for Carly. He sees what's coming down the road in expenses and repairs. He sees what's coming down the road in things you're going to need, emergencies that come up. He sees the hospital bills coming up. But in the meantime, we're going, oh, I don't know if I can do what God wants me to do. So we get this rather than this. And you're saying, are you saying that that comes? I am saying that that's what the Bible says. And until I become in the business of managing what God has given me the way God wants me to manage it, I will never experience the way God wants me to experience. I can get by, I can, I can get used to the cupfuls, but why get used to the cupfuls when you can have the pitchers full? Why, why get used to that when you can have some pressed down, shaking together and running over? Let me see what I'm talking about. If I was in business today, I would make sure that I make it God's business. GM, Ford, Chrysler, they all have Christians working in it, but it's not God's business because they don't tie the profit. If you're in business today, make God a part of your... If, if you are, are the, the person that determines the finances home, make God a part of it. You say, well, I don't have the ability to. I don't have that. It's because you can't keep sowing bad seeds and expect good things to happen. 
You can't keep sowing debt and expect you to have be debt free. Come on, somebody. So you have to live in a house a few years longer. So you have to drive a car, an older car that you pay for cash. Okay. And when you get rid of the debt, what happens then? Because as long as I plant seeds that do not prosper, can't, God can't prosper correctly, that, 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 that are for wants more than needs. I lose. I lose. I've actually told people, because I do financial counseling, I have through the years. Don't have a lot of people come to me anymore because I tell them what the Bible says. I say, you know, you need to get rid of that. You need to stop that. You got to cut this out. I mean, just this week, this is a small, go ahead. Give them all a hand. Help, help Debbie. Just this week, my, my wife and I were talking, and, and we have we have a, a cable vision, and and we happen to have a ability to see it in two different rooms. And I, I looked at her, and she looked at me, and she said, "Do we really need that?" And I said, "No. Take it out of the room downstairs, which is my like man cave." So I walked to the back of the television set with hands trembling. Unplugged the cable, unplugged the box. And this was not just any box. This was the box that had the ability to record four movies at one time, four television shows. This was a fantastic box. This was a, a box that all men would dream of if they ever want to record sports or something. Four things at the same time. And with hands trembling, and watery eyes, I unplugged it. I took the cords and tucked it under my arm. I went to the Spectrum dealer and said, here. What are you doing? I don't need this. This is just something. I don't need it. I wanted it. I don't even need it. What does it say? $18 a month? What can $18 a month do? Oh, I don't know. Maybe put on something else to put you out of debt. What would $18 a month do on your credit card? Uh, extra. Or a bill. See, what I'm saying is that we sow bad seeds and we complain about we don't have money. We sow bad seeds or we don't do the rhythm of giving. And God, God, God says, I'm sorry, but I would give you more if you would manage what I already give you. Well, how about this? Your kid comes to you and says, Dad, I wanna, I, uh, can I have a dollar? And you love your kids, so you give him a dollar. And you go out, and he goes out and blows it on cotton candy. Eats it in 30 seconds. And he comes back to you just a little while longer and says, can I have a dollar? So wait, 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 I just gave you a dollar, son. Well, what'd you do with it? I bought cotton candy. And you knew that because it's all over. So, yeah. <laughs> can I have a dollar? What? I, I don't, well, okay. So you give him another dollar and he gets another cotton candy and eats it, destroys it, comes back five minutes later. And he asks for another dollar. You go, wait a minute, this is a bad investment. This could have no end. I love my kid, but he's not managing money right. Money's too hard to come by. Me just keep dropping him dollar bills for cotton candy. He's just, how many know what I'm talking about? All right? And that's what God does for us. We're going to say we, we'll save the money for him or we'll do something with it, put it in a little piggy bank or something until he gets a place we can manage it and make a good decision. Don't you do it when you do that with your kid? Sure. That's what God does with us. He says, I have this reserve, I have this for them, but, but they're not making good decisions and they're not, they're not doing according to the rhythm of giving and receiving. And so what's happening is it's working against them and it's destroying them. I know people that got promotions and were destroyed because of it. I know people that made big money and got away from God because of it. The result was they're away from God. 
So don't, don't think for a minute your blessings and your money is all going to be everything you need for life. No, God's first looking at the fact like, am I Adam or am I Eve? Can I manage the garden that belongs to him and do good things with it to keep the harvest and keep the blessing going? Or am I going to eat my seed? Amen. What time is it? Oh, my gosh. How many give me just another minute? Nobody? Oh, okay. Just teasing. I was going to do it anyway. John chapter 14. Does anybody love the Word? Is anybody learning anything today? Three people. Okay. John 14. Watch this. written down. Hold on just a second. Okay. John 12. John 12. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he'd raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served Lazarus among those who eat with him. So the dead man who now is alive, sitting down eating with Jesus in this home. that there. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of an expensive perfume made of the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet, wiped it with his hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the nard. But Judas Iscariot, the disciples who would soon betray him, said that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, Judas Iscariot. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he's the treasurer, he also stole some for himself. And Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and to see Lazarus, the man who Jesus had raised from the dead. So here's what's going on. Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. They are now at the house of these very grateful people of what Jesus has done. Jesus has brought the whole entourage with them. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, comes and breaks this alabaster bottle on Jesus that is filled with a perfume, a anointment called nard, which is very, very expensive. The little bottle that she anoints him with, meaning she just poured it on him and just went all over him, is worth a year's wages. So I don't want you to stop and think. Is there anybody that you know right now that you would take one check that represents your whole year's wages here at the beginning of 2019 and buy something and give it to them? Think, you probably got your W-2 by now, and you saw what you made last year. If you were going to go out and buy a gift for them, in this case it was perfume, or buy something for them, would you take your whole amount that you're shown on your W-2, go out and buy that thing for the whole amount? No, I'm not talking about keeping any. Go out and buy for the whole amount and give it to them as an expression of your love. Anybody here do that? I'd have to scratch my head, I'll be honest with you. I'm going, hmm, I don't know, how are we going to, all these questions of how am I going to make it, what's this money? Anyway. It didn't make any sense that she would do this with such an expensive gift to pour it out on Jesus. It didn't make any sense to the disciples. Got any disciples here today? Followers of the Lord? Two or three, five or six? Okay. It doesn't make any sense for her to do that. It doesn't make any sense for other people to do that. Some Christians don't think it makes any sense to tithe. Some of the Christians think it doesn't make any sense to serve. Some Christians don't think it makes any sense to support missions or do things. It doesn't make any sense because it's taken out of my pocket and given to somebody else. I mean, after all, come on. God lives in heaven. God has streets of gold, gates of pearl. God has all this stuff. And if he doesn't have, he can speak it. Boom, there it is. Why does he need my 50 bucks? Why does he need my 10 bucks? Why does he need my 100 bucks? Why does he need my 500 bucks? Why does he need the seed sown? Why does he need my tithe? Because, just because it doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean it doesn't make sense to God. 
It didn't make sense to the disciples why this woman was pouring out this expensive perfume on Jesus' head right before the Passover. And the Passover represents being saved from death, a ritual that goes all the way back to Egypt when the Passover angel went by because the blood was on the door. Somehow she knew that the blood of this lamb of God, Jesus, was going to save them from death. Somehow she was eternally grateful with a heart filled with love and compassion because her brother was dead. He was dead. They had him buried in the grave until this man came and said, roll away the stone. And now he's sitting there leaning back, eating a meal. So it wasn't a sacrifice for her because the sacrifice for her was no sacrifice because of the love that she had for what Jesus is to her. When Jesus is really your Lord and Savior, when Jesus is really the King of your life, it's not really a sacrifice. We don't really have to struggle. Because we understand that all giving, all gifts come from God. You cannot take Giving away from God, you can't take God away from giving. You cannot take love away from God. You cannot take love away from giving. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Because God loved me, he gave his son. Because God gave his son, he showed me he loved me. So when this woman, she was totally on page with God. When this woman gives a a year's wages and the disciples are going, this makes no sense. That's a crazy woman. We could be feeding the the, the poor people, the hungry people. Jesus said, let her alone. Why? Because he knew. He knew it made sense in God's rhythm, God's economy. Even though it didn't make sense in theirs. Because for Mary, it wasn't really a gigantic sacrifice. It was an expression of love to give, just like it was an expression of God's love to give his son for us. Yes, it was a sacrifice, but the sacrifice wasn't as important as the love. All of God's giving to you and I, all of God's blessing to you and I, comes as a result of his love for us. The needs that you and I have, the needs that we all go through, are to point us back to our dependency to God and knowing that under God's economy, His love is what provides for us. God doesn't provide because we go through these laws. He provides because He loves us. But yet, He does establish a pathway so that we can know the path, so that we can say, I don't know the way. He says, here's the way. Anyway, I was telling you about this car, and I got in a car, and I was driving this van. It was brand new. I'm driving so, and I'm thinking the whole time, I don't, I, I got to take this back. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not going to be beholden to any man. I'm not going to, and, and the Lord says, no, I gave that to you. You what? I gave that to you. Now you can use the money that you were making on car payments and stuff like that and put it in my kingdom. Now you can use the money you were paying for repairs and put it in my kingdom because you got a warranty now. It wasn't, oh, no, man, now I need to get a trailer and then I got to get an RV and then I got to get a thing behind that so I can pull it and I got to... No, 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 that's not what that's about. It's, It's God was preparing a way that I didn't even think about and dropped it in my heart. Didn't deserve it. But practice the rhythm of giving. I believe today there are people here that need to get convinced that you need to practice the rhythm of giving. You need to stop sowing bad seeds of debt. You need to do whatever you can to get out of debt. Like I say, I counsel people in this, and and part of the time I, I don't get good response because I tell them the truth. I said, you don't need it, sell it. Sow some seeds to get out of your problem. Amen. I have a son that, gave, that gives away cars. He's given away used cars to people that need cars. And God blesses them. I know some of you you, you, you give out and you plant seeds in other people and God blesses you. Good for you. 
But others, they take the seed, they take their stuff, and they, they, they eat their seed, they, or they consume it on themselves, and they just take care of themselves without regard to the kingdom and, and what God. And so, so when they get in trouble, they go, well, God, what's happening? I'm so mad. I've been going to church. I love God. God says, you're eating your seed. You're planting bad seeds. You're digging yourself a hole. Why don't you turn it around? So how do we turn around? Start tithing. What? Yeah, I know only 25% of the church does it. But I can guarantee you the 75% that doesn't do it, I'm always hearing about problems they're having. Isn't it amazing? You don't tithe and you have problems. Now, I'm not saying that if you tithe, you'll never have a problem. But what I'm saying is you can be rest assured if you're tithing and, you, and that you will be able to plant seed, sow seed so that you can have a harvest so God can help you with your problem. If I'm starved, I'm going to put seeds in my garden. I'm not going to sit there and eat the whole box by myself of seeds. Amen. So as your pastor, and those who are here and listening, this may be the most important message I've ever preached in this area and spent such time, because it will require your whole heart. It's now go past the time of knowing what the Word says to now you know why. By managing and doing what God says... God is able to do what he said. It's not just by give and shall be given to you, press down, shake you to go run over and don't give. It's not just by saying that verse 15 times and then do one of these when you're able to do more. You see what I'm saying? Because God says, do this so that it can become this. So then it can, may become this. I don't know. It's up to you. God's not in depression. God's not bankrupt. God's not trying to pick and axe the streets of gold and sell it. God's in good shape. And God wants to take care of you and he wants to take care of your family. Do it God's way. Do it God's way. If you come to me, I'll tell you this away from the pulpit, privately, or whatever. Do it God's way. And you'll never, ever be sorry. There's only a couple places in the Bible where it says, prove me. And one of them is in giving. It says, prove me now and see that I don't pour out a blessing on you. So, just like we've done in the past, we've preached... On, pr on prayer, and then we ask you to pray for the week, right? Even gave the verses. And then we preached on fasting, and we ask you to fast on Wednesday or sometime during that week. We preached on community, and we encourage you to gather together, serve each other, spend time with each other, let your light shine, love, the, love each other before the world so that, you know, some of you are going to possibly have Super Bowl parties, you're going to have gatherings, you're going to invite people. Invite people that need Jesus. Don't make it us for no more. Include people in. And now we preach on giving, so guess what we're going to do? We're going to give. So Rick, I'd like for you to get the ushers ready. Let's receive our giving for this morning. This is going to be your first chance to respond in what God is asking you to do. And because now you know why we should do it, not just know what it says. I believe this, there's going to be changes made in a fantastic way at the big, big, very beginning of this year. What I'm asking you to give is your tithe. It's the water. It's what God receives. And then some of you support missions. Some of you support other ministries. Some of you support missionaries. Some of you do jailers. Some of you do other things. That's your seed. That's the free will. Your tithe will water that and you'll get a harvest. Father, I thank you right now for this privilege of giving, this important message, I believe, that, that the church needs to hear because I believe that, that you're wanting to use us mightily and there's going to be things that happen that we need this empowerment, not just of spirit, Lord, but, but of the wherewithal to change the world. And Lord, I thank you that as you reach in and talk and speak to people's voices, that they don't become the woman in this chair but that rather they become the woman this, that could have been in this chair, receiving the fullness of what's expected. 
Speak to our hearts for the seeds and the offerings and help us to be faithful in the tithe that we give in Jesus' name. And we trust you, Jesus. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Let's receive this morning. I appreciate that message. Say a good amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Clap of praise. I made up my mind this year that I'm...